My uh, text for this morning is just one verse from the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. A saying of Jesus that we are quite familiar with. Um, Jesus again spoke to them, John tells us, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. May God bless his word to us today. These words that John records Jesus as saying, um, he said, according to John, while he was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And over the last several months, actually, I have brought up uh, the three pilgrim feasts that uh, the, uh, the people of Israel were commanded to keep. Um, I brought that up several times in several different sermons for several different reasons. And this was one of those feasts. It was the third on the yearly calendar of those pilgrim feasts where um, God commanded that the people of Israel should leave their homes and gather in Jerusalem to celebrate this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And the, the details and the reasons why they were to celebrate this feast are uh, given to us uh, for the first time anyways in Leviticus chapter 22. The Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated at harvest time, and this time, this year it is uh, pretty much the first full week in October as the, um, as the Jewish people will once again this fall celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And because it is uh, at harvest time, it is also sometimes called the Feast of Ingathering. But the purpose of the festival was to remember the 40 years that the people of Israel had spent in the desert uh, after God had delivered them from their slavery to Egypt and before uh, God brought them into the land of Canaan. You remember the 40 years, often called the 40 years of wandering, the, the desert sojourn. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles was about. And it was actually uh, one, of the, one of the highlights or one of the centerpieces of the feast was that the people of Israel were to build temporary shelters or sukkot for themselves. And the Jewish people continue to do that today. And the purpose of those temporary shelters was to commemorate uh, and to remember that for those 40 years, the people lived in tents because they were nomads. They didn't have um, homes and buildings, permanent homes and buildings that they lived in because they were traveling from place to place. Another highlight of the feast in Jesus' day was that on the first night of the feast, um, the temple would be lit up. And uh, um, there were actually four candelabras. Each of them were 75 feet tall that were set up in the court of the women at the temple on the temple mount. And those 75 foot candelabras were lit up. And you can imagine the scene. And um, they were lit up with a lot of fanfare and celebration. And there was singing and dancing. Um, and so when the light, of the of the candelabras, you know, began to shine. Um, it is said that you could see that light. It was like daytime for most of the city. And imagine how far, not only already on the Mount Zion where the temple was, but also then that extra height of the candelabras and and how big they were and how much light they gave off. They could be seen for a long, long way away. And that light from Mount Zion was intended to signify the pillar of fire that was God's presence with the people of Israel as he led them during those 40 years through the desert. 
But in Jesus' day, when messianic expectations were high, that great light that was shining from the Temple Mount would also have stirred in those people the hope of the coming of the Messiah. They would have thought about and reflected upon what the prophet Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 9 when, when he says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, one of Isaiah's many messianic prophecies. For unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given. And in Isaiah 60, where the prophet says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. The Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Isaiah goes on to say that there will be no need for the sun, because God himself would be their light. And imagine that picture of it's, it's nighttime and yet it's bright and light in the city of Jerusalem because these candelabras are lit up and, 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 and stirring the hopes of the people for that day when their coming Messiah would bring the light of day with him. And so in rabbinic tradition, light came to be one of the names of the Messiah. The Messiah would be light. And it was in that context, as Jesus taught in the court of the women, the very place where the massive candelabra had been lit, set ablaze just a few days before, probably. It was in that place that Jesus makes this audacious claim, I and the light, not only of Jerusalem, but of the world. And it really is a bold claim, isn't it? When is the last time someone came up to you and said, hey, just so you know, I'm the light of the world. The implication of Jesus' words would not have been lost on those that were there that day. Essentially, what they understood him to be saying was, I am the fulfillment of your messianic hopes. These hopes have been stirred in you again as you saw that great light shining out from the Temple Mount. I am the fulfillment. I have come to fulfill those hopes. And if that claim by itself wasn't enough, he also added even more shock value to his claim. And he did that with the words that he used to make it. He said, I am the light of the world. And that expression, I am, would have also had tremendous connotations for Jesus' listeners. Because that particular way of saying it, which was not the usual way, would have reminded them of the words that God himself had used to identify himself in Exodus chapter 3. Remember where God says, I am that I am, he tells Moses. Moses says, who am I supposed to say that is, is, is sending me to these people? And God gives himself this name, I am that I am. The words that the name of God, Yahweh, likely come from. And Jesus uses, the, he, he, he says this in a way that reminds the people of those words. So not only was Jesus hinting at the fact that he believed himself to be the Messiah, he was also giving them a not so subtle hint that he believed himself to be one and the same with the great I am the eternal God. And as you may know, John actually records Jesus identifying himself in this way on a number of occasions. There are seven I am sayings uh, in total in John's gospel. He says, uh, in one place he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the bread of life. 
I am the way and the truth and the life. And in the most notable of Jesus' I am sayings, which is actually the eighth, he says in John 8, 58, truly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. What a bold claim that Jesus is making. And the people who heard him say that knew exactly what he was implying because John tells us that when they heard him say it, they picked up stones to stone him because what they thought when Jesus said something like that was that he was implying that he was equal to God. And for them, that was blasphemy. But that is exactly what Jesus was saying. I am the Messiah. I am the light that the prophet Isaiah spoke of that has come into the world. And not only am I the Messiah, but I am also the one who identified himself to you as Yahweh. I am that I am. I am the one who appeared to your forefathers in a pillar of fire and led them through the desert. And not only does Jesus claim to be the light of the world, he also makes this offer. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Not only is he the light of the world, but he also says to us, I will be your light to light your way. But that offer only makes sense if we actually need a light, right? doesn't do you any good if someone hands you a lamp, I, um, hands you a lamp in the middle of the day and says, here, you need this. It's not until the sun goes down and it's actually dark around us that we need the light. And sometimes the light can make the difference between light, between uh, life and death. I can remember a number of years ago uh, when uh, we, uh, as a family, did a trip out west and we visited the Grand Canyon. And Lyle and I would take long walks. He was beginning to uh, wrestle with the issues of life as a, uh, as, as a person in his mid-teens in that time. And so he and I would take long walks around uh, the campground there at the Grand Canyon. And uh, we had heard, actually, while we were there, that a couple of people had fallen in. And so it was really, really important for us as we walked the path, which sometimes came really, really close to the edge of the canyon, that in the darkness of the night, we would have a light. So Jesus offers to be our light, to light our way in this world, because the world itself is in darkness. The light only makes sense if there is a darkness that it needs to chase away. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in his description of the darkness and the reason for it as he talks about those things in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Paul says, though they, that is humanity, he is speaking specifically really of the Gentiles in this text, but he goes on to say, and the Jews are really, they fall into the same category. They, all of us, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. 
the issue that Paul is talking about here is that in our rebellion against God, humanity has taken unto ourselves the right to be our own wisdom. And what Paul says here is so fitting. By trying to be wise by ourselves, we have become fools. And he goes on in verse 28 of that chapter to go, he goes on to say, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, to recognize that God is the source of wisdom and God is the source of truth. Since they didn't see fit to recognize that, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. And he goes on in verse 29 and the verses that follow to list a number of things. And I'll just read a few of them for me for you. He says they were full of envy and murder, and strife, and deceit, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. What an apt description of the world that we live in. As we look around us, we can identify with the words of Isaiah again in chapter 5 and verse 20 when he warned, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. As we look around us, we can see that we live in a culture that increasingly is upside down so that evil is good and good is evil. And we can identify with the words that Paul said to Timothy as he warned him about the nature of things in the last day in 2 Timothy 3 and verses 2 through 4. And Paul says people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud and arrogant and abusive ungrateful, unholy, heartless, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And again, the prophet Isaiah describes that darkness of the world that we live in in chapter 59, verses 8 through 10. He says, the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. Righteousness can't catch up. We hope for the light and behold darkness. We hope for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. Why I look around at the world today and I see a world that is groping like those who have no eyes. And it's into that chaotic mess that confronts us every time we turn on the evening news. It's into the darkness of confusion and arrogance and strife and deceit and hatred that Jesus speaks into the darkness and says, I am the light of the world. Can you hear an echo in those words? Can you hear the echo of the words that we read at the very beginning of scripture in Genesis chapter one? where it tells us in chapter 1 and verse 2, the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was over the face of the deep. 
as I've said recently in a, in a previous sermon, that idea of the waters was a symbol of chaos, of disorder. And the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the waters. It's a picture of chaos and formlessness, disorder and darkness. And notice what God says as he speaks his creative word, his creative command. He says, let there be light. Let there be light. The same God who spoke light into existence and in so doing brought order out of chaos and life out of emptiness says to us, I am the light of the world. And John says, as he opens his gospel, he tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This world is a dark place, and it can seem at times, can it, that the light is fading and the darkness will soon overwhelm it. But take heart brothers and sisters. For though the darkness is great, the light yet shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, indeed cannot, overcome it. And the day will come when the declaration will resound from the heavens in the words of the prophet Isaiah, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. Thank God. We need not despair. Today we dwell in the valley of the shadow of death, but the light of the world still shines, and this dark and broken world will one day give way to the kingdom of light. Yes, and of that kingdom, John says, remembering the words of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 60 that we mentioned earlier, John says there is no need in that kingdom for the sun or moon to shine. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And his victory over the darkness is sure. And so he also says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. It's important that he adds that as well, because the fact that Jesus is the light of the world is not intended only to give us hope for the future. But he is the light of the world, and he can also light our way through this dark world today. Amen. Amen. And he calls us as his people to walk in the light that he provides. If you follow me, he says, you will not walk in darkness. 
what that means, what he is calling us to, if we want to walk in the light today, is a life of discipleship. You must walk as Jesus walked. Some of us have been run around long enough, and it's hard to believe that the 90s were 30 years ago, but I remember the 90s and uh, the bracelets that a lot of people used to wear with WWJD on them, and we still think and talk about them today. What would Jesus do? I would suggest that if there ever was a time, and there never has been a time that we shouldn't be asking, what would Jesus do? But if there ever was a time that we need to be asking, what would Jesus do? It is now for us. Only he and the example that he left us by his own life of obedience can give us the light that we need to navigate in these dark times. What would Jesus do? As we follow him in a life of obedience to God, as we walk as he walked, as we ask ourselves what would he do, and then strive in the power of the Holy Spirit to live that out, we become people who walk in the light. He not only lights our way, he not only lights the way for us, and this is another important connection that we need to make. He doesn't just light the way for us, but he also sets us ablaze like the candelabras in the temple court, so that we become lights ourselves. And so Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Not only am I the light of the world, but you are the light of the world. So let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father. The world is looking for answers as it stumbles in the darkness. And there are a lot of people who want to tell us what the answers are to our problems. And all you have to do is turn on the TV and somebody's got an answer. It's tempting to jump into the fray and to give our own two cents of what the answers are. And sadly, I think God's people are doing far too much of that. We need to step back. We need to be quiet. We need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? What does it mean to walk as Jesus walked? Jesus, who was the friend of sinners. Jesus, who went to those who were despised, who were outcasts. Jesus, who lived his life in humility and patience. Jesus who lived sacrificially, surrendering what was rightfully his in order to reach those that walked in the darkness. How would Jesus walk? What would Jesus do? As I mentioned last week, I reiterate again because I think we need to hear it and we need to let it sink in. We, as God's people, need to offer the world a better way, a different way, a way that is guided by the light 
and not more darkness. A way that is guided by the light of who Jesus is and his offer when he says, if you follow me, you will not walk in the darkness. My prayer for each one of us as we continue to wrestle and struggle through these challenging times. My prayer for us is that we will take hope as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that this darkness will not prevail, but that the kingdom of light is going to break forth into everlasting day. And my prayer for us as well is that we will take stock of ourselves, step back from the, from the mess and ask ourselves, what would Jesus do if we follow him? We will not walk in darkness. And as we follow him, we will be light to the world. May God give us the grace and empower us by his spirit to walk as Jesus walked. Amen. That we might be the light of the world. <clears throat> Father, we are so thankful that you have not left us to walk in darkness. You have not left us to stumble along the wall, groping our way along, searching for answers that always come up inadequate. You have sent your Son, and in him you have given this dark world light. Teach us, Father, to be children of the light, not to rely on our own wisdom, not to rely on our own ideas or our own answers or somebody else's answers, but to walk as Jesus walked. by your spirit and by your word. Teach us how to do that, we pray. That the light might shine through us just as it has shined into our lives through the glory of your son. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. May the Lord be with you as you go, and may we together as God's people commit ourselves to walk as Jesus walked. God bless you as you go.